Well, good evening. We sure are glad to have you with us tonight uh, for our midweek prayer service. I'm really excited about our time that we can have together in prayer. Go over some prayer requests. There will not be a missionary prayer letter tonight. Uh, we will have that next week. I'm in a bit of a transitional stage. As you can tell, I'm not in the normal uh, location for recording this. I'm actually in Arkansas right now and uh, returned back to the States to begin to get some affairs in order for our family uh, to begin making preparations to return as a family to Japan. And so if you could pray for us, we really would appreciate that. We're looking forward to a soon return rather than a later one. And of course, there's a lot that is involved with that. And so please pray for wisdom and direction in that regard. Uh, also, um, I would like to ask your prayers uh, right now. If you, you might hear throughout the message tonight in the prayer time, uh, some thunder in the background. Those aren't special effects. Um, rather, the, that is a, a string of some severe thorm, storms that are coming through in Arkansas right now and in Oklahoma and Texas. And so if you could pray for those that uh, may be affected by this uh, even now as you're, as you're uh, re watching this, uh, we sure would appreciate your prayers in that regard. Um, if you take your Bibles right now and go to Second Chronicles chapter 16, we're going to dive into this latter part of Asa's life and kind of close off and cap off our, um, uh, our time thinking about Asa and what all was going on here. And, and look at how Asa was so willing in this latter part of his of his reign, um, these last five years or six years of his reign, to just let go of real peace, and he really because he let go of what God was doing, he 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 experienced a decline of peace. Now we want to grow from this opportunity, and there are things we can learn here that will help us to avoid this. Um, many times we read in the Bible of those that had a rough kind of start to begin with, but they ended so well on their walk with God. But in this moment, uh, we find Asa kind of the inverse. He started out so well, um, but in his latter years, we find him uh, though he st maintains a a a. An authentic authenticity with God, um, and he maintains a, kind of a heart relationship with God, uh, it's not where it should have been uh, at that stage of his life. And there was some coldness there that could have been avoided had Asa done the right thing. So if you found your place in Second Chronicles chapter 16, I'd like to invite you to stand with me, if you will. And let's read some verses here from the Word of God. Um, we're going to kind of move forward and go to verse um, number 7. Now, we're going to be a little bit of context we'll have to cover, but I want, to, I want you to see what this prophet Hanani says to Asa in response to what Asa does here. And let's read this together, starting in verse 7. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 7, And at that time, Hanani the seer, and the seer is another name for prophet, uh, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, Therefore, from henceforth, thou shalt have wars. Let's pray together as we start. Father, we come to you now. We thank you for your love and grace tonight. We thank you for a chance to be in your word. And God, we do earnestly and, uh, and uh, pray that you would please just watch over uh, each thing that's done tonight, whether it be our prayer time or uh, even the preaching now, God, that you would just be lifted up and glorified. Father, help me not to say anything that would distract from your word, but Lord, help, help me to do only those things which promote you and exalt you tonight. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would uh, be keep that you keep folks safe tonight in the storms that are uh, stretching across the the southern part of America. And God, if anyone's affected by these storms, we pray that you would just help them and give them grace and Lord meet their needs and help them to find you strong in these situations. Lord, we do love you now. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your care and for your salvation that you have so graciously extended to us. Now it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may please be seated. I know I forget to mention that sometimes, and I, I know you know better than I do, and you'll go ahead and sit down, but I always feel bad in my mind's eye thinking, wow, somebody may have just sat there standing with the Bible um, because I failed to say, please sit down. So please uh, go ahead and please be seated, uh, and uh, let's move on with, our, uh, with the Word of God tonight. Uh, this decline of peace, how did Asa experience this decline of peace in his life? He had so much time in his uh, kingdom where he had no war. Um, matter of fact, uh, you find uh, when it comes to uh, reading 1 Kings and 15 uh, and 2 Kings uh, chapter th uh, chapters 13 through 16, you kind of find 
I wouldn't say a conflicting system of verses, but rather you find um, an inside story into what was going on in the nation, in the, in the divided nation of, 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 uh, of Israel. Uh, you have the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judah, and they are uh, really at odds with each other. And what you find going on with Asa is that Asa really, as a king, was experiencing very little conflict outside of the nation of Israel as a whole. Um, when it came to other nations, he had uh, treaties with them that his father had set up. He had a lot of uh, deference with these kingdoms. And so really in his kingship, he really had no key, uh, real war, as we find in verse 19 of chapter 15, uh, regarding external things. And then as you get to chapter 16, you look in verse number 1, you find that this Baasha, king of Israel, uh, he comes and he sets up a, a siege. He lays siege to the nation of Judah, or the kingdom of Judah. And when he does this, if, if we're not careful, we might think in our mind's eye, wow, this is the first time this is happening. That is not true. As a matter of fact, when Baasha uh, basically effectively instituted a coup in 1 Kings, in, uh, I believe it's chapter 15, somewhere in that range, uh, you read how he staged a coup and took over uh, the kingship from Nadab. And when he takes away the kingship uh, away from Nadab, who only ruled for two years, uh, you kind of get the sense that there was a conspiracy that maybe he even assassinated Nadab. Uh, we have real, no way of just uh, of, of, of understanding, knowing that for sure, but we do know something bad happened. And Nadab was dead and no longer able to lead. And Baasha takes away um, the, uh, the kingship from him. And so Baasha, it says in 1 Kings, uh, that he... Uh, would have war with Asa the whole time both of them were sitting on their respective thrones. And so, though we had no external wars, there was this consistent civil war atmosphere going on between the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. That's important to understand to get some better context here because if we just thought this was a one-off situation where Baasha comes down and lays siege to uh, in Ramah and tries to stop folks from getting into Judah, we might think, wow, Asa maybe just kind of made a slight mistake here. And that's not necessarily what happened. Uh, matter of fact, uh, because of this consistent civil war for over 30 years, uh, we find that, um, you know, Asa had, had, got, had grown weary of Baasha. And because of his weariness and because of his uh, exasperation with this civil war that was now affecting him and his people in a very real way, he became frantic. And instead of relying on the Lord, he relied on man. And that is always a problem. Uh, Asa sacrificed, as we'll find first of all here, the things of God when trouble came. Uh, you find it in verse number one um, and verse number two. In the sixth and thirtieth year of the reign of Asa, Baasha king of Israel came up against Judah and built Ramah to the intent that he might let none go out or come in to Asa king of Judah. Then Asa brought out silver and gold out of the treasures of the house of the Lord and of the king's house and sent to Ben-Hadad king of Syria that dwelt up Damascus saying, there is a league between me and thee as there, uh, as there was between my father and thy father. And so you find uh, that but, uh, Asa goes to the king of Syria and asks him for help. And the way he pays for this external help is by taking those things that were dedicated to God, as we just read about last week, in verse number 18 of chapter 15, and he takes them now back out of the treasures of the Lord, uh, not much longer after it's been put there, and he gives them to the king of Syria to secure uh, safety. Uh, my friend, this was not an accident. This was something that happened in Asa's life to test him. We know that's true because we read in verse number 9, the message of Hanani, where he says in verse number 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of uh, them whose heart is perfect toward him. We find that Asa did not respond wisely to the situation, and had he done so, Hanani actually says that he would have delivered Syria into his hands. Now understand that when these kind of leagues were made, uh, this was not something where uh, you know Syria just says, "Okay, you know, don't worry, we're not going to attack you." No, this was a promise of tribute, and so the nation, the nation of or the kingdom of Judah, was having to pay tribute 
to Syria. And as part of this, uh, uh, this alliance, they, will, they would both benefit. Uh, and so they relied on Syria for this safety in this league, and they would have to pay for that safety. And God said, look, if you would have just relied upon me, not only would I have taken care of ba Baasha, but I would also have removed the yoke uh, of the alliance with Syria and removed them from you. And so he missed out on a great victory. This is because this, this test came because God allowed it, but I believe this was initiated not, you know, it was initiated more by more than just Baasha. Baasha was a godless man who walked in wickedness. And when people walk in wickedness and walk in godlessness, they follow the inclinations of the devil. And so Satan was using Baasha to bring an examination against Asa. And we know that Satan is constantly examining us. Uh, it says in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober and be vigilant. Those words mean to be sober, be sharp-minded. Uh, don't be drunk and, and in a drunken state. Don't be in a stupor. Don't be foggy-minded. Don't rub the sleepies out of your eyes. Be sober and be vigilant. Have an awareness about you. We're, we're to approach life in a sober, vigilant fashion. We are to live life on purpose for God. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking. He is always evaluating. He is always analyzing. He is always examining. He will examine your life. He will example, examine my life. He will examine our children. He will examine our spouses. He will examine our homes and our work. He will find any place he can to find a foothold. Why? Because he wants to exploit that place of examination. The rest of the verse says he's seeking what? Whom he may devour. And in this moment in time, Asa, in his exasperation, in his weariness with this back and forth civil war and the pressure from Baasha, constantly looking to take over the kingdom of Judah, and in his weariness, he was not sober minded. He was not being vigilant. He just took the easy way out and it cost him. Satan will examine our lives, our homes, our marriages, and our children for a foothold. And this is why Paul, writing in Ephesians chapter 4, says in verse number 26 and 27, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. My friend, when we operate in the flesh, as this is insinuating here, and we allow anger and wrath to rule our lives, and many other things as well, we give a place for Satan to have a place in our lives and to get a foothold in our homes and in our lives. Asa sacrificed the things of God when trouble came. And the question I ask you as we make get ready to make some application is, when trouble comes and discomfort arises in your walk with God or in your home or in, in your relationships with others outside of the home, what is your first response? Do we try to be deceitful and, 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 self and, and operate in self-preservation? Or do we exercise justness and honesty? Do we exercise in pride and we arch up and we swell up as if we're going to go into a fight? Or do we humble ourselves and we know we've blown it we make ourselves and we make it right? What is our response in the time of difficulty? Do we run to God and, and seek God's wisdom and God's grace? Or do we run to substances and, and, and people who might influence us to do things that are contrary to what God would want for our lives and contrary to what is conducive to a good walk with God and partake in things that tear down our walk with the Lord. How do we respond? Asa sacrificed peace for false comfort. You know, a lack of resistance in life doesn't always mean what I'm doing is right. I have had so many times people who have put their heads in their hands and have shaken their head back and forth, and I've done the same thing whenever some kind of trouble comes up, and I wonder, what have I done wrong? Is God mad at me? Did I do the wrong thing? And my friend, just because things get hard in life doesn't mean you've made a wrong decision. Rather, uh, sometimes a lack of conflict in our life and a lack of things that are you know, seem like to go awry are, are more a result of the devil not bothering you. I had a friend in college um, who, uh, you know, I, he was a very big encouragement to me. Um, 
you know, he would always, his play, his his space, we all had our space in our dorm where we would just kind of have our quiet time with the Lord. And his was, he really enjoyed making some coffee and sitting at the kitchen counter um, in our dorm room. And we lived in a modular trailer, so there was four different rooms in the mod. Um, I like to be in the living room or in my room uh, with my, you know, blanket pullover and my lamp on. He preferred to be out there with some coffee at the kitchen table. And that was just his place. And that was his time of prayer and time with the Lord. I remember walking out there and... He just didn't seem like himself that morning, and he seemed restless. And I said, man, what's going on? And uh, he looked at me, and he said, I'm just having a really rough morning this morning. I feel like I can't get things right. Things just are against me. And I said, well, you know, is you know, something going on? And he said, no. He said, I'm pretty sure it's just the devil trying to get in my head. And I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, I've kind of realized that sometimes if your life isn't having conflict with the devil, it's because you're walking the wrong direction. Um and that's true. Uh, sometimes we get our lives in the world and in our flesh and we're operating outside of, of, a, of a submission to God and his way and his will. And the devil just sees that as destructive in and of itself. And he just doesn't have to give any, any mind to us. Um, you know, and that's the way it goes. Uh, if, if someone knows that, that they can, that they don't have to bother me, that, that I'm going to do the wrong thing no matter what, if Satan knows that, um, then he's just going to leave me alone because I'm going to destroy myself. And sometimes, you know, a lack of conflict or a lack of discomfort is not a, it does not mean that God is blessing what I'm doing. I've known people that have lived in outright sin and they think because their life is going so much better now that they've, they're living this way, that now God is just blessing them and that, and that now that, you know, they're on, that this must have been the way it was supposed to be all along. And that is not true. Um, the path of least resistance is not always the right path. And that's not to say that following God is always stubbing your toe on everything. Um, you know, sometimes it might feel that way sometimes, but it's definitely not. Um, even in the middle of, as we'll talk about, in the middle of all these conflicts that we can experience in life, we can still have peace and, and, and knowing that God is still blessing what's going on, even though there seems to be some conflict or resistance uh, to what we're doing. And so Asa, he, he didn't want resistance. He didn't want discomfort. He didn't like this siege that was being put against his people. And so he sacrificed you know, the peace that God had given him and blessed him with for over 30 years on an external scale to find some local peace in his local kingdom there. And you know, a lack, uh, lack of resistance, like as we said, doesn't always mean something is right. Uh, being a disciple is not likened to a, a nap or, or to a reclining uh, uh, or to reclining and relaxing. It's not a cot. Being a disciple is a cross. Luke chapter 14, 20, verses 26 through 27 says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now that word hate there does not mean like angry, detesting, and disgusting. You know, it's not like that. The word hate there means to, to give God deference over, um, to, to put God first and those second in my life. Um, and so it's, it's more of a debasement uh, from, a, from, from, from a place where God should be. And what, God is say, what Jesus is saying there is, and unless I'm willing to follow God first, no matter what, in spite of every relationship I have, then I cannot be his disciple. Because God must come first in my life. And he says in verse 27, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Jesus' his entire life... Yes, he had good times. His early ministry was only a few years. And I have no doubt that he had moments of enjoyment and times of enjoyment. But there were many times in Jesus' life, especially those last several, those, those, those few years of his earthly ministry, where there was constant resistance. And that was no indication that what he was doing was wrong, obviously, but rather an indication that what he was doing was right. And so please be careful that, you know, sometimes we think a lack of resistance is God's will. That is not always the case. Matter of fact, many try to find the convenient way to be involved, and that's just not how we follow the Lord. 2 Samuel 24, 24, King, uh, David had made a mistake, and he would numbered the people as God told him. He took a census as God told him not to do. And when he took that census, God judged the nation of Israel. 
um, because of David's uh, foolishness and as God was judging, he, David needed to make a sacrifice before God. And, he, and it says in verse 24 that he goes to Ar uh, Arauna uh, to use his threshing floor uh, to make a sacrifice. And this man says, look, David, take it. I'll give it to you. And David says, no, I'll give you money. And he was, de he was uh, determined. And he says, no, King, you take it. And you offer to God everything I have. And David asks here, he says, nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God, that which did cost me nothing. So David brought, bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. David gave a fair price to this man to purchase the things that were needed for the sacrifice because he would not give a costless sacrifice. So many people want God to be pleased with their life that has no cost to their life. They, have, there's, they don't have to deny anything. They don't have to give up anything to be a disciple of Christ. And that is just not discipleship. Um, there will be things in this life that you will have to say no to. There will be opportunities you'll say no to because you've chosen to follow God and not follow self. Acts 24, 24, and 25. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Paul was preaching to this man, Felix, who was in authority. And Felix, it says in verse number 25, trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time, and when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Felix was convicted by the Holy Ghost. He was convicted about his need for Christ, like maybe you are tonight. Maybe you've heard the gospel time and time and time again. And in your heart, you know you need to put your faith in Christ and stop trusting your baptism and stop trusting your works and stop trusting yourself and stop trusting others, but to turn to Christ and trust what he did for you in his death, burial, and resurrection. And maybe you're like Felix and you keep telling God, no, oh, when it's a better time, when I'm older and I'm having, I, don't, I can't have as much fun or when I've sowed my wild oats or, you know, no, it's not time to put off God. Tonight, today is the time for salvation. Many try to find the comfortable way to be involved, not just convenient, but comfortable. One scribe came to Jesus one day and kind of wanted a comfortable ride with the Lord. He figured the Lord being the master uh, would have maybe a, a cushy place to put his head. And in Matthew 18, 19, chapter 8, verse 19 and 20, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 8, verse 19 and 20. A certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And the Lord knew his heart, and he said to him, verse 20, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have their nest, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. See, this man was looking for a place to rest in the, in the glow of the Messiah. And Jesus said, I don't have a place to rest, because his ministry was not about rest. Many try to find the, comf uh, the comfortable way to be involved, and Jesus discouraged this kind of discipleship. Some have asked the question, if God wants us to follow him and God wants us to receive him, why does he allow it to be so difficult sometimes? Why not make it easy for the people of God and, and just take away all their troubles? As if God is being disingenuous to his invitation to follow, in his invitation for us to follow him. My friend, God does, in fact, desire us to follow him. The Bible said that God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering, not only that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants everyone to be saved. He wants everyone to follow him, but he is not going to force us. John chapter 6, verse 63 through 68, Jesus is physically present, and Jesus is teaching truth. And he says in verse 63, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, there, and he, he said, therefore said I unto you that no man could come unto me except it were given him of my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. You see, my friend, the Lord is going to give you opportunities to have an out. And we experience them at different gauges. I know in my life alone, I've had some times where the Lord has offered me an out. Do you really want to walk with me? 
do you really want to serve me? Having seen the ugly side of people, having seen the ugly side of ministry, having seen the difficulties it can bring, will you still follow me? And it'll happen in your life too. Those times when your kids don't understand what you're trying to do for them. And they argue and fight with you about the stand you're taking in your home. And they pressure you by their peers to do things that you know are not right in your home. It can get discouraging. and You might feel like throwing in the towel and just being the cool mom or the cool dad. That's not what you're called to, mom and dad. You're called to raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It might be that moment where your peers uh, try to pressure you to, to drop your standard and, and, be, and to live a little and not be such a, such a killjoy. My friend, that's not what God has called you to. You've been called to operate as a representative of the Most High. You have a glorious opportunity to represent the joy and fulfillment that only Christ can bring as he lives and works through you, and as you walk in a holy submission to him, as you live separated and different because he has made you different from the inside out, you have a holy opportunity to be an ambassador for Christ. Don't drop your standard for temporal satisfaction and temporal acceptance. You know, a lack of resistance doesn't always mean it's the right thing to do. And a lack of restlessness doesn't always mean it's wise. You know, someone has once said, follow your heart. Do what feels right. But sometimes what feels right is absolutely wrong. Proverbs 16, 25, as we talked a few weeks ago in our Sunday morning service, that there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I must discern what I am thinking, what I am feeling, and who I am following. And then when I've discerned what I'm thinking, feeling, and who I'm following, I need to find out, does this flow from the Bible's teaching? And is the Holy Spirit leading? See, too many times we allow ourselves to feel and think things that are not in accordance with the word of God. And we nurture those things and they're godless. Those are moments to to put down every, as the Bible says, every thought that, that, that uh, it rejecteth uh, the obedience of Christ. To put it down. Why? Because God wants to break those strongholds in our life. Those things bring us into bondage. Those things bring us into baggage. And God wants to liberate us from those things, but we have to take those thoughts and bring them into captivity in the Lord, bring them to him and submit those thoughts and feelings to him so that he can change those things and make us new and make us whole as he wants to do in this life through the process of sanctification. Yes, my friend, Jesus has saved you and you'll never be more, if you've accepted his free gift of salvation by his death, burial, and resurrection, if you've put your faith in him, you will never be more saved than you already are right now if you've already placed your faith in christ but my friend that doesn't mean god's done there's a there's teaching going around right now that when you're saved that you cannot sin and what what they mean by that is not that you won't sin it means that in god's eyes we don't we don't sin at all because he only sees christ and and so we don't have to worry about sin we don't have to confess our sin we don't have to live a right we don't have to worry about how we live our life if, if we mess up hey it's no big deal just move on with your life no no god wants us to maintain a right walk with him and that is false teaching yes we ought to sin less but when we do sin the bible says we have an advocate with the father jesus christ And when we do sin, the Bible says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart in the book of Psalms, he will not hear me. And with that, it does not mean that he just won't hear your prayer. The very next verse says, but yea, verily thou hast heard me. God is a merciful, gracious God, and God can hear. The question is, will God hear? And my friend, I feel like God sometimes turns a deaf ear to our prayers and chooses not to hear our prayers because we have chosen to hold on to sin and iniquity in our lives, and we have not given that up to him. Lack of restlessness doesn't always mean it's a wise thing to do. Our hearts could be deceiving us, and I must discern how I'm thinking, 
how I'm feeling and who I'm following and ensure that it's proper Bible teaching. But can I tell you tonight, you can be listening to the right people, you can be feeling the right things, you can be thinking the right things, and it still not be God's will. You want an example? I'll show you Acts chapter 16, verses 6 and 7. Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Now, stop and, and think about that for a second. You say, I don't believe you. That's not in my Bible. Turn to it. I invite you. Read what the Bible says there. God is not willing that any should perish, which is true. God said, go ye therefore into all nations. We're to teach the gospel to every creature. We are to go and preach the gospel. Paul wanted to preach the gospel. Paul was endeavoring to preach the gospel and go. They were thinking right. They were feeling right. But the Holy Spirit said, don't go. Not just once, but twice that we read about here in this passage. Verse 7, And after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Asa had experienced 32 years of civil war with Basha in Israel. This was a distant uh, type of civil war, almost like a cold war, if you will. And it never really cost him much at home. However, when the civil war began to make things difficult at home, Asa caved to comfort. Notice in verse 2 and 6 how Asa sacrificed what belonged to God from the temple. And Asa made a pact with those that God desired to free him from in verse 7. And Asa gave up an opportunity to see new victory in his relationship with God in verse 9. This can manifest in our lives in several ways. We might sacrifice our personal time with God for some extra minutes or hours of rest. But this often results in extra stress, extra frustration, and regret in my foolish decisions because I was not relying on the fullness of the Holy Spirit and direction of God. Sacrifice, I might sacrifice real discussion with my spouse regarding a God-honoring home for quote-unquote peace. I don't want that fight. I don't want that argument. I don't want that discussion. And so this results in disunion in the marriage, a dissolved front that is obvious to the children because they see it, that mom and dad are not on the same page, and a lack of godly sanctuary and instruction in the home. Our homes are not meant to be a battlefield. Our homes are meant to be a haven of rest. That's not to say there's not trouble sometimes. Lord knows that, that there is turmoil at home sometimes, but the general atmosphere of the home should be nurtured to being a place where godliness reigns and God's peace is on the throne. Sometimes we sacrifice God-honoring boundaries for our, with our children in their friendships, in their relationships with the opposite sex, in their entertainment choices, or controllable situations for the sake of fewer battles with our kids. Off, this often results in an undermining of attempts at godly instructions uh, by their peers and by the entertainment choices they make, temptation to sacrifice their moral upbringing in their, in their uh, uh, dating relationships, if that's allowed, and baggage our children have to carry through their lives, which, would commit, which could limit their ability to impact the generation for Christ. You know, I don't expect my boys to grow up and be pastors or missionaries. Now, that might make some people upset, and I'm sorry if it does. I really am. But I understand full, full heartedly from the Bible that not everybody was called to be a pastor or a missionary. But I do want my boys to grow up and walk in the will of God. And if I get to watch my boys grow up and be men of God that love their families, that follow God with all their heart, and do what they know God wants them to do and are a blessing to others because of it, I will rejoice just as much as if they ever answered the call to be a pastor or a missionary. Because the ultimate goal is not a position of spiritual leadership. The ultimate goal is that they are following the will of God, not the will of mom and dad. I want them to know that they're walking in the ways of God and see the hand of blessing that God can only bring in a life like that. But you know, at the same time, though i that's my heart, when I read the qualifications of a pastor and I read the qualifications of a deacon, 
I'm challenged by those qualifications to ensure that my boys are growing up and nurtured to live a life that reflects those things. Why? Because God might want to call them in the ministry. And I don't want to put my children, my boys, in a place where they compromise their ability to be used of God because they've made foolish choices with their lives and were not protected or nurtured in that direction. I want my boys to be able to be able to do whatever God wants them to do and to be limited by nothing. And that is what our, my wife and I have spoken about. That is our heart, that we raise our children right. And so they will be ripe for the Lord to use them however God would see is fit to use them. You know, we might sacrifice little battles here and there by caving into comfort and convenience. But my friend, those are ne- that's never the recipe for success in our homes. The reality is we must embrace in this life the battle that God has called us to in our personal walks with Him, choosing Him above self each and every day, our marriages before the Lord, our children who are entrusted to us by God. We must engage in the battle for all of those things. And it isn't comfortable. But again, we bring up the cross. Since when was a cross ever comfortable? And it's not to say that we can never enjoy life. On the contrary, this is a great mystery of the Christian experience. When I resolve by God's grace and mercy to engage in this battle and to die to self, it's then those moments I find that God fights the battles for me. When I resolve to engage in the work that God leads me to do, it's in those moments that I find his strength to hold the burden for me. When I sacrifice that which makes me comfortable and accept discomfort, I find that God fills my life with joy and contentment and blessing. John 4, 14, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into eternal life everlasting life. John 10, 10, the thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. God does not want to rob you of fun. God does not want to rob you of security. God does not want to rob you of peace. God wants to give it all of that to you more abundantly as you follow him. John 15, 11, these things have I spoken unto you that your, my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. In fact, the ones who find actual peace in their walk with God are the ones who have simply died to self, to self-satisfaction, to self-effort, to self-exaltation, to self-preservation. And they find that when they become empty of self, they are filled with the awe-striking presence of the Holy One. Matthew 16, verses 23 through 24 through 25, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And Jesus told his disciples that, that no one who, who forsakes all and follows him will not and, and goes through difficulty will not receive tenfold in the kingdom of heaven. God has a reward waiting for us. So John 12, 24, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. We know that if we don't plant seed in the ground, we don't have fruit. And though it might be tempting to eat all of the fruit of the ground, I must save enough seed for the harvest or for the planting season. Because if I don't save seed for the planting season, I will not have a harvest. And the same is true in your life and my life. I must be willing to lay down my life. Though I might want to enjoy every moment and always have fun and always just live live extreme on everything that there is to have in this world, I must be willing to temper myself and deny myself so that I can be able to do what the rest of the verse says. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians, I believe chapter 4 where he says, death worketh in in us, but life in you. 
Paul says, look, it's not fun. It's not easy. It's, it's not fun being shipwrecked. It's not fun being stoned to death by people. It's not fun being heard and persecuted and lied about and gossiped against and uh, resisted. It's not fun. He said, it feels like death. But he said, death worketh in us, but life in you. See, we have to die to self so that others can be impacted for Christ. But that's not what Asa did. He did not make this purposeful choice to live for God that day. He did not choose to rely on God to resort to his word or to request his wisdom. No, he failed to do this in this moment and it cost him peace and well-being the rest of his life. He capitulated to the moment, to the, to the immediate, and he gave up growth. He gave, he gave up growth because he rejected God-ordained leadership in his life. We find it in verse 10. Then Asa was wroth with the seer and put him in a prison house, for he was in a rage with him because of this thing. You know, it's funny. Sometimes when we get out of whack with the Lord and we uh, aren't... Uh, we have sin in our life or, 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 or sinful attitudes in our life or maybe pride in our life. We start to lash out against those that God has placed in our life to help us. Uh, we look for excuses not to listen to the preaching. We look for excuses not to, not to be a, a part of the local church. We look for excuses to get out and it hinders our growth. It, the first evidence of our love for God going cold or that we have unconfessed sin we are harboring in our lives is a lack of personal time with God. And, when this, and, and this is what we need the most. In Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 through 19, God cries out to Israel to, to be clean and put away their evil doings from before his eyes and cease to do evil. Why? Because in verse 18, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. God wants to restore, not hurt. And sometimes I think we get ashamed of ourselves before the Lord. We miss a few days of our Bible reading. We don't give that gospel track like we're supposed to. We, make, we, we cave to the convenient in our homes. And we feel like, well, that's it. It's done. No, it's not done. We all make mistakes. And as we'll see, Asa here made a big mistake. But he could have made it right. He could have made it right. But it requires personal correction. 1 Corinthians 11, 31 and 32, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. We ought to allow ourselves to check ourselves. I shouldn't have to have God beat me over the head with something from his word to get my attention. No, a mark of Christian maturity is when I stop having to have God constantly convict me and, and I start to live according to his word and I judge myself. And I start to realize, no, that, that probably doesn't please the Lord. And I become easy for the Lord to turn my heart. We also need interpersonal correction. Hebrews 3, 12 through 13. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you and, or, sorry, if lest there be any of you with an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily, which is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. We need godly people around us helping us to stay close to the Lord. Uh, Asa gave up growth, but he also gave up graciousness. You find in verse 10, uh, in the, in the second part of verse 10, and Asa oppressed some of the, apost some of the people uh, at the same time. The second evidence is lashing out at those around me who seem to be easy prey. We call this kicking the dog. This can look like outright harmful language or action. We might lash out at others in our anger at ourselves or at the Lord. This can look like sulking. Think of Ahab and he wanted Naboth's vineyard and he went home and pouted about it in 1 Kings 21. And, and he went home and his wife asked why he was pouting and because I wanted a vineyard. It was next to my house and I want that piece of land. And, and Naboth ended up being killed because Ahab wanted that piece of land. Sometimes it's outright 
violence. Sometimes it's just sulking and self, self-adulation and self, self-loathing. And really, it's just pride. James 4, 6 and verse, James chapter 4, verse 6 and verse 10 tells us the recipe for restor- restoration. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. He gave up growth, he gave up graciousness, and he gave up greatness. Not his own greatness, but the greatness of God. He resorted to the physicians when he got sick. We find that in verse 12, and Asa in the 30 and ninth year of his reign was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease, he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. We find here that Asa, because of his grief toward the Lord and because of his his coldness toward the Lord, he gave up the great healer for those that had no real strength, wisdom, or ability. And Jeremiah 17 verses 5 through 8 tell us that, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land and not inhabited. You know, when you stop trusting in the Lord, you start trusting more in people and 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 in and in the things of this world to satisfy you, you'll end up dry and empty. Because only God knows how to heal us the way we're supposed to be healed. That's what verses eight or verses seven through eight say of that same passage, Jeremiah seventeen, blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord. And whose hope the Lord is, for he shall be a tree planted by the waters, and it spreadeth out her roots by the river. It has stability, and shall not see when heat cometh. They'll have per, uh, a perpetual safety and, and, and moisture. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Our lives, though there might be harsh storms that come, and there might be external conflict, internally we are secure and satisfied in the Lord, because we trust him. You know, the third evidence is that we start becoming involved in things that are more immediately pleasurable. You know, I love this, the, the tell, I love what Hebrews 11 tells us about Moses, how instead of choosing the sin of this, the pleasures of sin for a season, he chose rather to suffer affliction with his people and do the will of God. But some people don't turn to the will of God, they turn to vice or hobbies or anything that can be an excuse to get away from time with God. They turn to things that are more immediately plentiful. Sometimes we turn to things that we, we leave doing what God wants us to do to do things that uh, seem like they benefit us first and not the way of God. Things that bring more physical comfort or more fiscal comfort. And that might not be the Lord's will. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, we read of a man who did that. Demas, it says, hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. You know, Demas's fault was not that he got into some egregious sin. He just stopped walking with Paul and serving God because he was tired of sacrificing for the cause of Christ. He wanted to live for the temporal, this temporal, present world and not for the eternal kingdom to come. Sometimes we give up things, we give up graciousness, or we give up comfort, we give up growth, we give up all these things. Why? Because we want to be more palpable with people, palatable with people. We want people to accept us. And so to have more acceptance of our peers and for folks to like us more, we stop raising our standards so high. And that's not what we're supposed to do. These things are all fleeting. They they come and go. I'm reminded as we close of the example of the prodigal son in Luke 15. He He gave up his relationship with his father for money and for fun. He left his home in a place of security for the wild wickedness of the, of the world. And who he thought were his friends, his confidants, once they spent up all his money, they left him penniless and broke and empty. And we find him, after all of that, at the pig farm, in the slop, eating the leftovers that the pigs wouldn't even eat. And you might be there tonight. I'm not trying to exalt that situation because I hate that for you. I really do. But sometimes God allows our lives to spin so out of control, not because he wants to hurt us, but because he wants us to see the great destruction that sin can bring in our lives when we let it take hold and take reign. My friend, 
it's time to do what this young man did. Come to yourself. What I mean by that is wake up. That's what that means. When this kid woke up, he had a moment of soberness. Why am I here? Why am I eating this? I could be at home. And he humbled himself in his heart. And he went in humility back to his father. And Jesus telling this story is telling us when we find ourselves empty and broken at the end of ourselves, God is not waiting to slap us back down in the mud. He is waiting as a loving father to receive us and restore us. But it must come with humility. Asa didn't do that. Asa was angry, he got mad at the preacher, took it out on the people. He went to the physicians looking for healing from just mere men when he knew he needed to go to God. And his pride was the ruin of him. Let's not be that way tonight. Maybe right now, God's been, maybe during this message, God's been convicting you about an area of your life where you've been capitulating to the comfortable or the convenient. You've been giving in in your home or in your relationship with your wife or in your workplace, or in your walk with God. You've been, you've been sacrificing what you know is right because it's just a little bit too hard for you. My friend, the, the challenge is simply this. It might seem hard for you because you're not looking through the lens of the eyes of faith. You're viewing God as some kind of cruel taskmaster when what he's really trying to do is lead you into a way that is joy unspeakable and more fulfilling than anything this world could ever offer. How about you tonight? Will you embrace the cross God has called us to? Will you let God use you to impact your generation for him? Will you stand strong in your home and your marriage with your kids? And if you don't know Jesus Christ tonight, Maybe you've been putting it off for a more convenient season. You just feel like you're not done living for the devil just yet or living for yourself just yet. Please don't put it off any longer. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. We're not even guaranteed the next five seconds. But God is ready to receive you today. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now. Thank you for your love and grace in our lives. Thank you for this time together. Now we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we look in this, uh, some prayer requests that were given here today um, and throughout this last week. We asked you, please, to pray for um, a lady named Nicolena. Um, we heard, heard a good report. They, she, they, she had, um, her, her, her grandparents had tested positive after her mom had tested positive for COVID. Uh, had no complications but mild symptoms. They all made a full recovery. So praise the Lord for that. Um, we've also heard about Dante. We were praying for him. He's made a full recovery. Praise the Lord. Um, we also have some folks we're praying for um, that are friends of the Shaver family. And um, they said that uh, uh, her, the, um, they said that, that, there's a, that the grandmother and friend are making a recovery. So that we've heard a good report so far. Um, but the, uh, the, the, there was some uh, real complaints about hard time breathing and things like that. And so... Um, you know, there's, there's some real difficulty there. So please pray um, for the for Ree's mother. That's it's the request there. Pray for um, a family, uh, the Har some friends of the Harjo family. Uh, I've heard recently uh, of, a, of, of a pastor and his family that were in, New, uh, I believe, New Mexico. And they have, uh, the, the virus went through their family and, and, and several of people died in their family. So there's some rejoicing to be done, obviously. Uh, for physical healing, but there's also some that are mourning today. And so please be in prayer for these as, they, as we, they've been mentioned. Um, pray for those that have that are about to uh, possibly go on deployment. Um, don't want to give, obviously, too many details um, for OPSEC reasons, but uh, pray for uh, what's going on there um, on the base um, and around the world for our, those that are deploying and those that are returning from deployment. Um, they sure could use it. Um, pray for those that are in quarantine right now. I'm sure they could show you some prayer and encouragement right now. And then also uh, pray for uh, some that are on the docket for uh, to get deployment or get to uh, um, PCS orders. 
uh, some are seeking God's wisdom and God's will and where they'll go next. And so please pray if, for that that's coming up. I know the Hughes family specifically asked for that as well. And so if you could please pray for them as they make uh, those decisions um, in the coming days. Remember those that are expecting in our church family, as far as I know, Miss uh, Hughes is expecting um, as well as Mrs. Knight. And so if you could pray for those things. I did ask you to pray for the appointment coming up on Thursday, this past Thursday. And praise the Lord, we heard a good report on the, from the doctor on a healthy, happy baby. Uh, so far, mom and baby are both healthy. And so please continue to pray for that. But we do rejoice in that good report. Um, well, I believe that's it as far as what I have given so far. If I missed the request, I'm so sorry, church family. Please forgive me for that. Um, but if you have a request that you'd like to turn in for our Wednesday night prayer times, um, if you could just email me at fbciwakuni at gmail.com. Uh, we'll get that put on the docket. Or you could also uh, private message through uh, Facebook Messenger to the Faith Baptist Church uh, uh, Facebook page, and we'll get that as well. Uh, we'll go ahead and pause right now for prayer. And we'll come back and close the service. Well, I sure appreciate the time of prayer that we've had together tonight. And uh, if you need anything at all, please let us know. I'm um, looking forward to being back in Japan with you, God willing, in the near future. And, uh, and be, remember, remember to keep each other in prayer throughout the rest of this week. And we'll see you this week again. God bless.